Welcome to Talks with Taryn, where I talk with people from around the world and share our conversations with you. Today's guest is Matt Diamani. I recorded this interview um, last week and it was just one of my favorite interviews that I've ever recorded. We talk about so many different things related to design and business. Um, I think that we really hit a lot on how design needs to change in business as well as we talk about UX designers versus product managers and where those roles are going. We also talk about how to deal with remote teams and offshore developers. Um, We also have some discussions on different schools of thought within design. So if you're interested in design at all or business, or if you work on a product team, I think this is definitely the talk for you. And I hope you enjoy as much as I did recording it. Oh, and one more thing. I got so excited during this interview that you'll only see Matt's face and not mine because of something that I must have clicked in Zoom. So today I have a lovely guest, Matthew, and I'm actually going to get Matthew to introduce himself because I know that he'll do a much better job than I will. But the reason I brought him on today was because I read one of his articles that was talking about um, roles in design and how the hierarchy or your experience works in terms of design. Um, And I'm going to ask him a little bit more about that article once we get into it. But to start us off, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Matthew? Sure. Yeah. I just want to say thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you, get to know you a little bit better as well. Um, My name's Matthew Amani, as she mentioned. I'm the vice president of product innovation for McGraw-Hill Education right now. Uh, And I've spent almost 20 years, which I hate saying because it's aging myself, but uh, spent almost 20 years in uh, design and design thinking and all in major corporations, actually. And I'd say that my focus point now, the latest buzzword around this is design transformation. But the focus point really for me has been on helping integrate design methods uh, into the existing corporate structure while also hiring design teams and bringing them in. So it's been a really interesting ride. A lot has changed, um, obviously, since I first started, but then a lot of things have sort of stayed the same too. So anyways, I'm glad to be able to chat about it and whatever else you might want to ask. Yeah, um, this is, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I need to like contain my excitement. Um, Yeah, so one of the questions I actually have a little bit further down, but you kind of bring it up now, is what has um, changed over your career and more than that, like you can first answer what has changed, but then secondary, what has shocked you? Um, is, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I think, so the biggest thing that's changed, design is popular, really popular now. You know, I think that it was starting to get popular when I graduated. I went to the Institute of Design, which is in Chicago. Um, and at that time, they were one of the few schools that actually had a master's degree in design. And now there's a ton of places offering masters in design. So, you know, it was a relatively unheard of discipline. You know, companies really at that time, for the most part, still thought design was just a visual aesthetic kind of thing. Like they were just bringing you in to make stuff look good. And, you know, this notion of using design from a research standpoint to really understand what the customer needs are, and then really, you know, sculpting your product and your service offerings based on that was just unheard of. And, I think that, you know, it's been amazing to see that dramatically change. And I think that, um, you know, it goes hand in hand with the shocking thing for me, too, because I really think in the last five years in particular, it has just exploded. You know, I mean, you've got, you know, whole corporations like Envision that are just focused now on tool sets for design. Um, There's enormous, you know, amounts of conferences now that just didn't exist that are really focusing in on different facets of design from design ops to design strategy, to just design thinking, to design process in general, back to the old stuff like usability uh, and user experience. So it's uh, just in the last five years, it seems to be following one of those curves, you know, an exponential curve. It's not even linear. It's just getting so much more popular. And I've found that to be very surprising honestly yeah no that's it's it's funny that you mentioned five years ago because that's when i started professionally was five years ago so i feel like i've been riding that ride right like i i started and then it's um it just took off. oh 
no, no. <laughs> it just no. took off and it was crazy. So no. the next question I have for you is no. what stayed the same? What it stayed the same, you know, um, design itself has. So one of the things that I, this is just a personal opinion. I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me on this, but um, I think the core nature of what it is we're trying to do really hasn't changed at all. In fact, if you look at some of the writings that were happening in the 80s, even, you know, the core of what we call user-centered design, human-centered design, design thinking, <laughs> user experience, experience design, service design, it's the same. It's the same concept. And that's, you know, putting the voice to the customer at the pinnacle, at the center of everything that we're trying to do from a product development perspective around it. It's still this focus, although this has shifted a little bit, on qualitative methods and the value that they may present and on rapid prototyping and putting those prototypes low fidelity ideally in front of customers you know that core hasn't shifted and i think that you know um one of the things that i've personally been frustrated with over the years is that people try to spin it in different ways you know i think that some of the agency influence on design has made it so that designers try to market everything they do so all of a sudden we're calling the process something different or we're saying that we have a dramatically new methodology, but the reality is the change is relatively small and the philosophical core and process is the same. And so, you know, I think that it really is an industry while a lot of the fringe elements and maybe the wrapper around it has changed, the core within it has largely remained the same. And, you know, I think some of the areas that, you know, have shifted a little bit is moving more towards participatory design that's got a little bit different, I think, philosophy behind it. And, you know, you see some more of those methods being used and being talked about. And those aren't very new. I mean, those were being discussed, you know, a lot back in the 90s. But, and I'm surprised if they haven't gotten, you know, more um, influence than they have. But people are using them and talking about it. They're just kind of on the fringe still. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And you're kind of talking a little bit about this qualitative um, versus quantitative thing where I find that sometimes, especially larger companies, have a little bit of a hard time getting onto the qualitative research side because they just want to use numbers and they're thinking very much in like stats and, you know, they're, they're, they've been in the business world for so long and they're not necessarily thinking about what qualitative research can bring to the table. So how do you get those businesses on board so that they'll invest in that type of design, basically? Yeah, that's, so that's, that's a hard thing to do, right? I mean, to your point, most of these corporations are still focused on quantitative. And in fact, you've seen some of that, I think, bleed more into design than where it was. You know, back when I was out of school, quantitative methods were certainly valued, but I felt like there was more of a divide there. Now it's like you see a lot more data-driven design and more around analytics and sort of you can see quantitative has taken more of a foothold. And I think it's because of that reason that, you know, one, we're getting better data analytics than we've ever had due to technology, but two, you know, designers are trying to sort of meet that need from businesses where they want more of that quantitative research. And, you know, one of the things that I've done is I focus a lot on trying to build cultural change when I get into companies and explain what the purpose between qualitative research is. You know, if you think about a business and, you know, if you think about kind of our, our bias towards, I would say, science, um, where it comes from, research is seen as being about truth. And I'm really big on helping people understand that research from a design perspective was never intended to be about truth. In fact, design's philosophical perspective is more that everybody can be a little bit different, you know, and that that's why we have to do qualitative research because context matters. People's different situations, different behavioral dispositions, different genetic backgrounds make a difference. And so research really isn't about trying to solve a theory. It's not about coming up with the perfect solution and the perfect needs for a customer, it's about driving inspiration. We do research to help us identify more creative ways of solving problems. At the end of the day, it's inspiration driven. And I think that's always an interesting shift for business people to try to kind of grasp. It's like, we're not trying to come up with the right answer. We're doing research to simply infuse the design team with more creative options. And so this research doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be statistically significant. It doesn't have to be done over the course of two or three years. 
You know, it's like, we just want to get out there and talk to some people to help spur some ideation sessions. <laughs> yeah, I definitely see it as like, it's adding empathy, right? It's like the, the big reason that I like doing qualitative research is so that I can go back to businesses and get their kind of like empathetic juices pumping as well, right? Like that's, that's like my draw is like, I feel like putting myself in their shoes, like that's relatively easy for me just because of my personality. And it's also probably why I'm a designer, but it's getting those other people also into their customer's shoes that like gets me even more excited because then there's more connection happening between, you know, humans. Totally agree with you on this empathy piece. And that's another thing that I, I talk a lot about is that research is also from, I feel like the design perspective, it helps you prioritize, which is where this empathy piece comes in. You know, I have a I have this great story I love to share with people. When I was at Mayo Clinic, um, we were researching our uh, mayoclinic.com website and we had some content loaded up around cancer. And what was really interesting about that was this uh, woman that we were, you know, was participating in the research. We didn't know if she had had cancer or not. We were really just sort of having people read the content and help us understand what was working and what wasn't. Um, but she started crying while she was reading this. and. You know, it was, be, you know, when we found out it was because she had been diagnosed with cancer in the past and luckily had been in recovery, but um, she was really offended by the tone. The tone was very uh, medical and, you know, she felt like it was a little bit abrasive and, you know, it was interesting was, you know, you could go back and tell the editorial team, well, the editorial tone isn't, is too medical and they would just say, well, you know, we're the editors and this is our expertise. Of course, it's going to be medical, but to be able to show a video clip of a woman crying spontaneously helped create a sense of priority and urgency. And I think that, you know, to your point, that's what is really powerful about qualitative research is it helps people carry, you know, the customer with them in every single step of the process. And, you know, I think that, again, we're not doing this to try to find the ideal pattern that they're moving through a website. We're doing this so we understand if we don't get anything wrong, we can't get this wrong. You know, this is the one thing we've got to get right because this is what's making people cry. This is what, you know, they're throwing their fists down in frustration. And so to your point, it's really hard to get emotional um, relationship out of a survey. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can even do a survey about their emotional responses, but you personally, experientially are not feeling it. And if you're not feeling it, you're likely to not care as much and maybe not prioritize it as much or not spend as much time on it or not take that extra step to really push it up the leadership campaign trail to get them to change it, you know? So great point on empathy. Yeah. And I love that you're bringing up prioritization too, because I think when people start thinking about building products or um, you know any type of product, whether it's physical or an application or, or web-based, um, there's this kind of tendency of not understanding that obviously there is a budget, right? Like there's always going to be a budget. And yes, like everybody wants to be able to accomplish all the things, but a limitation is always gonna be time or budget and or. Um, I've personally never worked on a project where we had unlimited time and unlimited budget. So no. um, that's, that's where it comes into play too. Prioritization is a huge thing. Like if we had all the time and the budget, then we wouldn't really have to dig deep into these things because there would be no need for prioritization because we'd have a giant team that would do everything and it would be the most perfect experience possible, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and I mean, design, you know, I always tell people, um, you know, design is the glue of an organization. It is, you know, we sit in the middle of all the different stakeholders from, you know, your developers in IT to your content team, to your product management team, to your project management team, to your sales and marketing team, all of them rally in a sense around what is the design? What are we trying to build? How are we trying to build it? And why are we trying to build it? And all of that can be you know, designers can help contribute to that conversation. And I think that, um, you know, we're in this unique position, like you're saying, from a resourcing standpoint and a budget perspective, you know, to say, hey, but we do need to do a better job on the marketing end of this. It's not enough to just hit the product on this. This is so serious that, 
the editorial tone of the website needs to carry through to the marketing materials. And so you're right, we're not going to get an unlimited amount of people, um, budget or resources, but we are the ones that sort of are in the unique position to say not only to identify that it's needed, but also to try to then champion it. And I think that, you know, some of the, again, the research and the other tool sets we have can help us with that. Yeah, so much. Yeah, if I was to like use another word for designer, I think one of the words I would use is facilitator and another one I would use is advocate because yeah. you're, you're advocating for the user. Um, and so sometimes even using those words can kind of shift people's perceptions. If you come into an organization and say, listen, see me as somebody that's going to visualize things for you, but also I'm going to help facilitate all these different areas and be an advocate for the user at the same time. And sometimes that, that helps, right? Where people go, oh, you don't, you don't just put pixels around on a computer? Oh, okay, we understand that. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, I love, I love what you're saying about visualizing too. I think that's the other core thing and it totally ties in your comment about facilitating. I had a great director of design research in my current role at McGraw that reports to me uh, named Hannah Pick. She did her whole thesis around what we would call boundary objects and you know she says whenever you put an artifact a drawing a whiteboard sketch um you know an excel spreadsheet in front of a group of people that's becoming an object that people are you know kind of in consensus around they're defining a boundary based on that object and so you can't underplay the significance of designers being able to help visualize thinking you know i one of the core things when i teach design and these corporations is I tell people you've got to stop having conversations up here swirling in your in your head because your mental picture of this is different than mine is different than the person sitting next to you and we're all looking at it through the bias of the departments that we work from but getting it out like you said getting it crystallized into a prototype or a drawing a boundary object um, can really help that communication and can help build that consensus and can help people understand and rally around a shared vision. And I mean, I think out of probably anything designers can do, that's one of the most valuable skills we can bring to the table in a corporation. And I think that it's underutilized, to be honest. I think that there's a tendency still for corporations to sort of funnel designers and have them working in these agile scrum teams doing this kind of work with um, development, but we are not leveraging those skills nearly enough on the product and the strategy side. You know, I mean, I know that I, um, you know, had the privilege and was lucky enough to have the ability at McGraw to do that. And I did bring senior leaders into a room together to come up with shared visions around our business strategy and what we were trying to do with our product strategy. And, you know, getting that visual was just so key and important for helping us then execute it later. Yeah, I love that you're bringing up strategy too. I think one of my favorite things is, I guess I would call it active whiteboarding, right? So like what you're saying, like bringing a group of stakeholders together and having them talk and then as they're talking, and this is my favorite thing too, a lot of times they won't even realize that I'm doing this, they'll be talking and like, maybe even arguing a little bit, which is fine. And then I'll be drawing and be like, do you guys mean this? And then they'll be like, oh, and then it'll create this like big discussion around it. And basically we'll figure out what the problems are that everybody is having with each other's ideas, which it just, I don't know, it just makes, it's like one of my favorite things about design ever is like having people come together and then actually knowing that they're all on the same page instead of coming into a meeting, thinking you're on the same page, going and doing your different things. And then later on down the line being like, wait, what are you doing? Like what's going on over there and having this disconnect happen. So to be part of that, totally. that taking away that disconnect is um, obviously it's not like I'm getting a financial bonus from it, but I'm definitely getting an emotional one, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what you do get as well, besides the emotional benefit is, you know, I, I like to tell people that getting all of this clarity is so important for your team. You know, if you're, if you're leading a design team, if you're not as a design leader working with your peers, you know, in these other teams to really get that kind of shared vision and understanding, your design team will suffer because again, we're the glue. And so to your point, what, what happens? We sit in a meeting, um, you know, I'm talking about, 
you know, my vision, you're talking about your vision. We think we're talking about the same thing. We're not. I go write requirements. You go create a marketing plan. You go create a sales plan and you go create an IT architecture based on a discussion where none of us were in truly in sync, even though we thought we were. And who ends up designing all that stuff? The design team. And what do they get? They get four different stories. And then who ends up being the mediators? the design team so <laughs> yes you're, ta you're talking to my soul right now <laughs> the earlier you can catch it the better right i mean actually i really feel passionately that a design leader's job is to help surface that stuff early because you know you are helping your team be more efficient productive and happier <laughs> later in the process you know oh for sure sometimes people want to like skip over uh I mean, they want us, they want to skip over sketches or they want to skip over wireframes and I won't do it. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, we're not like, if, if that's the way, like I've done it before and I've tried to be flexible about it and I've tried to just go straight into full on UI before and it's bitten me too many times in the butt for me to do it anymore. So I just have to say to them, like, listen, I understand why you want to, but it's going to save us so much more time. I promise you, like, if you wanted to bet me, it'll save us so much more time to actually go through these steps. You know, um, what, uh, one thing that might help you with that, that I've done, that's been pretty successful in the past is I tell people that wireframes are nothing more than visual requirements because they are right. I mean, if you think about it, if you draw a dialogue box, for email that allows you to print. You're gonna draw, you know, you're selecting the printer on there, you're selecting the paper type, you know, the portrait landscape. Those pieces become user stories. Normally someone would write a user story that would say, you know, user needs to be able to select paper size. You know, they don't say exactly how, but they're saying it. Well, all you've done is visualized it. And yes, we're sort of getting into that how territory because we've drawn maybe the way that the paper looks, but I always tell people, we can be flexible on that. The key thing is we're using this as a visual artifact to help us visualize the requirements before we write them. I always try to push to get wireframing done before the user stories are written rather than after. Because, and I, I've never understood that. It's like people write the user stories and then we do the wireframes. That makes no sense because yeah. the wireframe is a visual way to help us ensure that we're getting the user stories correct. Yeah, no, that's such a good way of saying it to somebody. It's a visual representation of what the requirements are. Yeah. I'm, I'm, totally, I'm totally taking that, sticking it in my pocket, and, and using it for the rest of my career. <laughs> so it you. really is. That's all it is. You know, it's just a visualization of what, it, of what it, somebody's writing. We're taking a written artifact and we're turning it into a visual artifact. Yeah, yeah. It is funny, too, when you're in organizations sometimes as a designer and you get this list of requirements. And then like there, there is this little bit of um, things don't quite match up, right? Because where do these requirements come from sometimes? Like I, I can't, I'm just not a designer ever that's going to be like at the end of the chain. I need to be there at the beginning. I need to understand what's going on like from a business perspective. Um, I mean, it's, it's part of the reason why I decided to start my own company, right? <laughs> so I was like, I can do it my way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so much more helpful when you can actually visualize things because I think people are also different types of learners. So some person might be better about reading words, but another person might be better about visualizing. So you need both pieces of those to go into every single department. Yeah. You know, I think one of the reasons, so earlier kind of tying it back to your original question, about what is one of the things that shocks you? I think one of the things that does shock me a little bit that's related to this is I feel like design and user experience really has sort of gotten winnowed into the agile development process. And what's really interesting to me about that is that's never what design was really user-centered, human-centered design was never really intended to get that far in the chain, in my opinion. I think that the value of it was more in what you would call the product planning phase. And I think that, um, and I think I'm going to write another article around this, actually, because I think one of the big confusions is we have this tendency to think of design just as one thing. It's like everything you hear, it's just this one process. And if people now are starting to kind of shift it into this agile development. But, you know, I like to think of it as there's about three or four touch points for design in business processes, strategic planning, 
uh, product planning, product development, and then uh, go to market, your marketing materials. So, you know, and each of those is a little bit different. And I think that the original intent behind design really was to create low fidelity prototypes to ensure we were getting the feature set correct to inform requirements. It was never supposed to be kind of this product management creates requirements and then design figures out prototypes on the how, like how we're gonna make these requirements happen. True human-centered design was supposed to inform those requirements too. And you know, that's again something that at McGraw we did implement. You know, I made sure that we put the design errors uh, with the product managers, really helping them prototype what they thought the requirements should be, because that's where the return on investment really is. You know, you can definitely spend a lot of time prototyping, you know, should we make this information filter? you know, a drop down widget, or should it be a turnstile, or should it be part of a AI search engine that predicts what they want? Like, we can do that, and there's value in that, but there's also value in saying, do they need a filtering mechanism, or is there something else we could be doing, another kind of feature instead? Is it just presenting them the right content? Is it presenting them some kind of a report? And all of that can be prototype tested too. So, um, Anyways, <laughs> no, I love that. It's like, I think you're hitting on a really key thing that I want to highlight is do we need it? I think so much in product development, especially, right? Like, there just becomes this tendency to, um, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to criticize anybody here, but I think that people get a little bit of experience with. UX because it is such a buzzword. And so then they start to try to incorporate UX into their different job roles. And what ends up happening is they'll try to be part of the research and they'll hear like one user say something that they want a certain feature. And then they'll be like, oh, we need to, we need to add that feature into, you know, our, our next sprint or something. And I'm always like that, that was one person, first of all. Second, they said they needed it, but I don't even know if they would use it, right? Like there's all these other questions that like come down the line. And I think it goes back to, do we actually need this or do we like, can we get, can we not do it? Right. Can we just cut it? Because you can make things so much more simple and you can test ideas um, in a really clear, concise way without adding all of this extra technology to products, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm really, you know, now that's somewhere where I do like quantitative data too. I love to run utilization reports just to see like what they're yeah. actually using in the product. Because a lot of times people will really be like, well, something like you said, well, we had five people mention it, but then you actually get at it and there's nobody actually using it. So sometimes that is where um, the quantitative can be helpful. But yeah, utilization is huge. I think that um, people over rate a lot of features and functionality still even though that's kind of a core tenant to design less is more but <laughs> yeah, it doesn't yeah, get less, less is more and one of, my, <laughs> one of my favorite things too is the idea of like the the wizard of oz right so like pretending like you have things happening even though it might be this manual process that everybody's trying to like get together and is doing in the background just to see if it's something that's taking off before you start um, throwing more budget at it. Like I, I love doing things like that where I'm like, okay, listen for, for a two week period, we're going to launch this and, and see how it goes. And then you like, so often does it, it doesn't go anywhere. And then you're like, look how much time we saved and how much money we saved by not, you know, putting this into the product timeline. <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think that, um, you know, market testing stuff like that too, even that's another pair. That's another part of design that I think in some places is getting underutilized is it's like, you know, we can take um, something and make a fairly high fidelity prototype, fully functioning um, code actually, but you know, you don't invest so much time in like figuring every single thing out, this long complex process, and you just launch it to a small subset of volunteers. And then you actually ask them like, would you pay for this? Did you find value in it? We don't do enough of that kind of real-time market testing and we have the capabilities to do it now. So that's yeah. always interesting to me as well. And the question you're asking is, would you pay for it, right? Because I think that sometimes if you ask, do you like it, would you want it? People go, oh yeah, yeah, totally. But then as soon as you're like, so you want to hand over your credit cards to me right now? Then they're like, no, no, I like actually not. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, that's another thing. Um, if you think about, you always see the three 
uh, the Venn diagram with the three circles about UX and you know design where it says you know technical feasibility, viability, and desirability, the good old IDEO framework. I don't even know if it's from IDEO, it's probably from someone else, but you know, that's kind of taken the you know big part of everything we see. It's in almost every presentation. But what I find really interesting is that you know, design a lot of times isn't partnering on anything but desirability. And, you know, we're not really working with our IT partners to say, well, what really is the simplest solution that's the easiest for you to do that still meets these other needs? What is something that they would pay for? We kind of like leave that up a lot of times to other departments from what I've seen. Um, and, you know, I, that's really not, we should really be trying to partner more on those other two as well because they're so yeah. critical. Yeah, and again, kind of the tool set can help, you know? Yeah, it's it's actually, you're bringing up a point too that like, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about offshore development teams. Like, obviously, like I'm now working remotely, which, you know, kind of changes things a little bit. But I have worked in companies where everybody is in person at the company besides the development team. And there is a large um, time difference which makes it extremely difficult to kind of collaborate in this whole different way. Cause if I had a choice, um, I'd rather just whiteboard something, have like a backend developer come in um, and discuss the architecture together and really yeah. understand like the reasoning behind the constraint that they have so that I can, you know, come up with a better solution that's still helpful for users. But there is this constraint that starts happening when, it's cost efficient to hire offshore developers, but then sometimes I wonder like, how cost efficient is it if you're having to rework things again and again and again, because there's, you know, things that are falling through the cracks. So do you want to talk a little bit about, <laughs> about development teams and, and in relation to design? You know, um, yeah, you know, one of the things I've found that's helpful around that a little bit, but you know, I didn't get to, didn't get to do it as much as I really would have liked. And it's, I think it's still a hard sale in some places, but you know, the, when I, uh, the last three years, I uh, managed a completely remote team. So including myself, I was remote as well. And I'm just stunned by how little the industry is still is supporting remote workers, particularly leadership roles, you know, because you can do these roles from home, you know, I'll say it again, you can do these roles working from home. Yeah, but one of the things that people have to do, and but I found it really helpful is you need to do workshops. So you know, to your point, like I found that most of design works very well across distances and time zones, except for that initial sort of whiteboarding and visioning session. Yep. And so the way that we mitigated that. Um, the last couple of years was we would fly people together for a concentrated three or four day workshop, or even two days in some cases. Uh, and, but, but they were extremely focused, time efficient and effective. And I think they were well run workshops, um, which is kind of patting myself on the back a little bit, but, but the key is to be, you know, as efficient as possible and get a shit ton done in that time period, but you can do it. And what happens is everybody leaves development, product management, marketing, you know, you bring a, a cross a disciplinary team together and everybody leaves with a common idea around the vision. And what happens as a result of that is then even if I make a whiteboard sketch at home and tweak it and send it to the developer, they understand where it's coming from and what's changed because we yeah. all rallied around the strategy and the initial vision. And yes, people balk and say, you know, that costs $40,000 or whatever to get all those people together for four days with the meals and the travel, international travel and all of that. But the reality is, and 40,000 was high, it was more like 10 to 20, but the reality is um, you get the ROI back because- yeah you're saving all of what you're discussing, which is the confusion, the, the wrong build, uh, the communication going back and forth. You know, I call that thrash, you know, because people are just thrashing around and it's extremely inefficient. Usually deadlines then get missed. We don't deliver the product we said we would. So, you know, yep, you pay a little bit money to get people together, but you're going to have a common vision and you're going to avoid problems downstream. And I thought it worked really well. I mean, it's a good technique and yeah. I just wish people would do it more. And I know that the, it's usually there's two things. It's that travel expense and then it's 
people don't know how to run good workshops. But. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I think that this is a great idea. Like you're so right. Because it's exactly what I was saying, right? Like it's at the very beginning of the product, like project that you need to bring people together and get them on the same page. And um, I, I just think this is brilliant. Like not to also pat you on the back, but I'm like, of course, why, why do companies around the world, like, why don't they do this? And it is, it is upsetting that, um, you know, it isn't done more, but hopefully in the next five years, if we are on this exponential, you know, takeoff of design, maybe it will, like maybe people will realize, oh, listen, I can get my products out there faster and I can get a clear vision and everybody's on board and every little decision that's made along the way, including maybe the code that an engineering is, you know, working away at night he thinks back to that workshop and actually makes a decision that's better for the product. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think to your point, like, right. It's like when you get everybody together at the vision, everybody feels included too. So it's yeah. like, it does, it does get that buy-in early on. It's like those developers understand what's going on. And you know, for this cost thing, um, what I always kills me about that is it's so much more expensive to pay for someone to sit in an office anyways, you know, the amount of money they save on overhead yeah. more than pays to fly people together for a week workshop, you know, yep. so, you know, like you said, hopefully people will start to get a little more open-minded about it. Yeah. No, I think that that would be a good idea to think a little bit about it too, because it is the perfect kind of combination, right? Like giving people the opportunity to work remotely, I think has so many benefits because people get to work in their most efficient like cycles, right? So like if I'm a person that like really enjoys waking up at like 4 a.m. and I want to work really early and that's when I'm the most efficient and then I overlap some of my hours with, you know, the rest of my coworkers, then why would we not as organizations want to give people that opportunity? Like why would I want to put that person into a afternoon slump? It doesn't make any sense, you know? Right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, I'm not somebody that wakes up that early and does that just for <laughs> just for the record. Okay. Yeah, Good. Good the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just looking here at the rest of the questions. Oh, okay. So I want to go and talk about that article that you wrote about um, the hierarchy of designers in organizations. And I'll ask you first if you can like summarize it a little bit and I'll end up linking it with this video so people could also go and read it. But awesome. if you summarize it for people, that'd be great. Yeah, you know, um, so uh, there's a couple different things I'm really fascinated. And one of them is, you know, what I call demystifying design because, you know, I feel like we, you know, again, because of all these industry buzzwords and like there's all these processes that people are marketing underneath their own names. And you know, anyhow, it's really become this confusing mess. And, you know, I, uh, like I said, I've mainly come into corporations over the years and I've built up design practices in these corps. So I've had to hire a lot of people. And one of the things that has driven me nuts consistently is how these job descriptions are so different you know it's like you've got creative directors and vps and senior leads and then design leads and you know people just have a plethora of names describing pretty basic design roles and i think that the consistency hasn't been there so like even you know uh you might say well okay this guy's got a vp title you know i'm not sure why he's applying for a manager job and then you realize well they've got two years of experience and you're like well why has he got a vp title because in my world a yeah. vp is one who's been around for like 15 to 20 years so. yeah. <laughs> you know but but you know who does that the banking industry now the banking industry does that period they have this weird hierarchy where they have vps regardless of if you're a designer or not but um, you know, there's just this lack of consistency, even things like what I call a UX designer versus what you call a UX designer, what you think of as being a senior designer versus not a senior designer. I've seen senior design job descriptions out there where they didn't require any work experience. Well, how can you be a senior designer without work experience, you know? So there's just been this lack of consistency. And um, the article really was just written to say, hey, is there a way we can think about these roles and start to sort of map them to each other and i thought one of the things that was logical for that was just behavior you know like what is it that we really are asking people to do and you know this isn't wasn't rocket science on my part you know it was really just sort of based on 
my working as long as I have and sort of seeing that there's this consistency kind of around milestones in people's careers. And as they get to those milestones, they get new responsibilities, ideally having mastered the old. And what are those new responsibilities that they're usually getting? And so I just kind of created a framework around that to try to say, hey, this is where I think some of these design roles map, you know, and let's use this to have a conversation or at least use it to help with your hiring. Like if you see someone of a certain title, but they're not doing these behaviors, they're probably not the person you think that they are for that role, you know? Totally. I think that's helping so much too with recruiters because obviously there's, there's a gap that happens there when you have like UX or design hiring managers and then you have the talent and then you have these recruiters in between the two like there is a lot of muddiness that happens um, you know the, the the best example i've got around and yes it's insane thank you the recruiter thing is crazy because <laughs> i get i get you know uh, emails from headhunters all the time and they're like we see this great senior level interaction yeah. designer for you and i'm like uh i don't want to be a senior level interaction i like, know I'm right like it, it's so off ago. <laughs> but um, it's so fascinating, right? But, um, you know, like what, what I think has happened to is like, and I, th I think some of this was because of the way design sort of set up leads is that they would take designers and they were just became masters of the craft. And so I'm a really good UI designer. So then I became a senior designer. Well, I'm so good and creative. Now I'm a creative director. And it's like they would promote this person's experience based more on skill set and seniority. Yeah. But that's not at all how it works in the business world. You know, in the business world, as you move into different bands and levels of management, your responsibilities dramatically change. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we have a lot of, I would guess, uh, ill-prepared design leaders in a business setting because they've got a certain title, but they're not working at all like their peers are, you know? Yeah. And so I really, one of the things to me that I think design as an industry needs to do and what this article was trying to do is um, we need to map the way we think about designs, processes, and roles more to how business functions and sees those things because there's a big disconnect between the two right now. And I think that leads to a lot of our problems around conversations and stuff. And it's not doing me favors, you know, because now <laughs> business, business is starting to say, oh, well, VP is a design. They don't do big change initiatives and they don't need a seat at the leadership table. They're just really skilled practitioners. Just keep them working on comps. And I'm like, no, you know, I, I deserve to have these conversations with you. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm, I think that that's also why like I, supported your article so much too because there is um there's there I mean when it comes down to it and this isn't a good or a bad thing but certain people have managerial skills and some people don't and some people don't even want to right so I think that a good example of this um an organization that actually recognizes this is Facebook where they say you can in still increase your pay scale there's two different tracks you can either stay on the expert track or you can go down the managerial track, but we are going right. to increase your pay regardless, but these have different titles to them. And I think they've done a really good job with that, right? Because I think some people do step into these managerial roles and they don't actually want to be managers. They just want to like excel at their career and they're an ambitious type of person. But really what they want to be doing is they do want to be on the computer doing stuff and creating stuff and they have their artists at heart. And right. like, I love working with those people, but then like they should be able to do what they're really good at and not be pigeonholed into a managerial role if that's what they don't want to do. Totally agree. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and, but, but yet still have a path because on the inverse, a lot of companies don't have a path for these rock star designers that, you know, they're really out there designing these award-winning products and they are truly are significantly better than a lot of their peers, but there's no path of recognition for that. Yeah. Hey, okay or more challenging projects, you know, because they haven't created that ladder, that second ladder that you're talking about. Yeah, I think creating the second ladder is so important because then you can have people that are really more focused on mentoring people that want to be those mentors to new designers, right? So if, if somebody doesn't want to be a mentor, that is totally fine, right? Like there should be a way for them to like excel and grow their career and get to the next level. And, and it should be prestigious, prestigious too, right? It should be like, look at the things that I've accomplished and the projects that I've work, worked on. But 
um, yeah. And then the people that actually do like mentoring, and I think I'm in this, this boat a little bit more like, I know that I'm not going to ever be the best visual designer in the world. It's just not my thing. You know, I would rather deal with like the facilitation and the communication and the structuring of things and the strategy and the mentoring and all of those like very juicy, but like kind of airy stuff. Right. Like that's the path that like is interesting to me, but I'm, I'm with you on the whole, like, let's not muddy it. Right. Like I don't want to have my career progress over the next, like 10 to 15 years and end up in a position where people are confused about what I do, even though it took me a lot of effort and um, strategy in my own career choices to get there, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think the other thing the article was trying to get, which, you know, I, we can't underplay too, is it's not even a deci- It's not even about people management versus yeah. um, more prestigious skills. You know, I was trying to explain to you that there really is these different bands that kind of develop. Like I know people that are directors and, you know, when you get that director level, um, you really get into what I call process management. It's like, you're not worried about the day-to-day execution of a project, you know, seeing the end to end, which is a, which is really more what a lead does or a senior manager would do. I'm sorry, manager would do is kind of looking more at like this project execution with leads at a director level. You're just saying, what's the process they're using to execute that work, to execute the project. And so you're, you're really looking at, um, you know, let's say the uh, prototyping process, you know, how do we do that? Is it, what tool set are we using for it? You know, what are we doing to improve it? Do we do low fidelity and high fidelity? When do we do them? How are we doing them? Do we do them with customers? What kinds of templates do we want to use? What kinds of tools we want to use? This is what a director really is looking at. They're bringing their expertise around design and saying, this is the best way for us to do prototyping. And then they're managing that process. You know, they're testing to see how it worked. If a project bombs out and the prototype wasn't successful, something's wrong with the process and they have to fix that. And they're communicating around that. I think that people, they have this tendency to say, well, director is just, it is just managing more people. And it's not just that, you know, I think there's this whole set of business skills that good directors, good senior directors, good VPs, good managers have that doesn't seem to always get into the conversation. And I think yeah. that's the other piece that I'm trying to bring some insight to, because I think a lot of designers, again, not kind of thinking about this business domain, they're not always realizing that this is an expectation out of them now, is that they're going to think and function in this way. Oh, totally. I also love the way that you've written the article where you say these skills that you're gaining along the way, like the one that you're mentioning right now around process you need to go through each one of these in order to understand the next one, right? Like if you don't understand how to create a process, then when you get to a VP level and you're working on those skills, like it it all relates back to at one point you were on the front lines and you built over time to where you are now. Yeah. You know, to, to your point on that, you know, and I, when I started my job now, uh, my boss literally his charge was, I want you to create a culture of human centered design. This was his charge. And he pretty much, that was his guidance. Like he pretty much set me loose and, you know, which is, should be what you do with a good VP. You don't have to hold their hands. But um, to your point, if I don't understand design process, like what's the best methodology for prototyping, for doing you know, research, how do I train people in this? If I don't understand these process and these methods thoroughly in and out and how they intersect with their business partners, product management processes, development processes, how can I be a VP and introduce a culture, which is being a change agent, right? I'm being asked to dramatically transform the way that business works. But if I don't even understand how business works, how the processes work, how can I change them? And so that's, you know, to your point, that's why that scaffolding has to happen. You have to become an expert in the one to be able to do the other, you know? Yeah, no, so much. It's uh, this conversation. I'm like, it's so amazing. (laughs) I hope that other people enjoy it as much as I'm enjoying it. Um, So I want to, instead of asking you a question now, I just want to leave it a little bit open and see if there's anything that you particularly want to talk about in design so that I'm not totally uh running this <laughs> running all the questions and everything yeah just you know just for a little bit of spontaneity and I also know you're a designer so you can feel a little bit flexible on the go 
Yeah, you know, I think we've covered quite a bit of it because I think, like I said, I've been really zeroing in lately. What I think has been keeping me up, there's two things that keep me up at night lately. One of them has been, I think we've overcomplicated our field, you know, and I really, I really do feel like um, what, what I feel has happened, I had this conversation the other day with some of the people on my team and they're like, that's kind of an interesting perspective. But um, so again, I don't know if everybody will agree with this, but I feel what's happened is because design has, I feel what they've done is design as an industry has come into business and said, this is how we do design. And they've made it a one-sided affair where it's like, this is, you know, a design process. We've all seen these flows, add them into business. But I think what the conversation really needed to be was, how does business work? And how do we add design into business? And I don't think the industry has really positioned itself that way. So what's happened, in my opinion, is business is starting to tell us where design goes. And I think that's why we see UX starting to be predominantly oriented to agile development. You know, when I first got out of school many years ago, uh, UX was not only about agile. And it was not only into the product development space. It was much more on this strategic side like we were talking about. And over the years, I'm seeing it get shifted and compressed. And I see a lot of discussions from people saying, well, you know, UX is about strategy. UX should be about strategy, all while they're then part of agile sprints and have designers embedded in scrum teams. And um, I think that's because we did a horrible job sort of asking business, what do you need from design? How can design best integrate into you? Tell us about your process and let's identify where design should fit. Instead, we just said, here's our process. And yeah. business not really knowing what to do to sort of then just cram it in with development. And I think that, you know, that's been detrimental to us. So I've been really interested in that. How can we um, start to have a better conversation with business and start to shift it? I mean, I'll be honest with you, and this is another thing that might be relatively controversial um, with people, but what's the difference anymore between a product manager and a UX designer? As far as when you think about how they talk sometimes about UX, now there's, there's truly a UX designer again in the Agile team, but the other way I've seen UX positioned is, well, we're talking to customers and we're figuring out what the product should be. Well, that's really interesting to me because I think that's what product managers do. Yeah. <laughs> and at, at one point in time, at one point in time, product managers did their conversations through market research and quantitative data, but they don't do that anymore. They're out there yeah, doing no, you're... qualitative research. They're <laughs> interviewing customers. They also are starting to learn how to put user stories in a collaborative way in front of their customers. So what really is the difference? And I think that because we're not having the conversation about design as method and how it infuses into business versus design as individuals or design as a process or whatever it might be, we're starting to miss the boat. And I think that designers, if we're not careful, could really start to get um, diminished. I'm very concerned about us getting diminished because other groups are going to just start to take over. I mean, I see things all the time now for human-centered marketing, human-centered sales. Yeah. And, you know, because we're not kind of participating in how we can fit into that, uh, the business is starting to tell us where we're going to go. And it's pushing us more and more into development while they're taking the methodology and just having keeping that at the strategic level. So I really want to see us expand that. So that's been the one thing that's been keeping me up. And we talk that's, a lot yeah, about that. That's such a good one too. I, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting trend. Yeah. You know? I, um, I feel the pain of the um, kind of UX designer and product manager. Like I've never held the title UX designer formally. I've always had other titles, like maybe like a product designer or something, but there's the role of a UX designer and the product, manager, I've definitely felt that um, tension. I'm going to call it tension, right? Where who who's doing what? And there's this like lack of clarity where, um, yeah, I think when I kind of start first started working with product managers, I had, a, I had a really bad experience actually the first time that I worked with a product <laughs> manager. A lot of designers have. <laughs> In all honesty, like it was, it was pretty horrible because um, and this is just like a one little off-sided thing, but I would whiteboard and create these things and be like, this is what we're going to do. And then I would go and show the product manager. And then he would present to the team, my whiteboards as his whiteboards and draw on top of them before I had taken photos of them. And it was just like, I don't know, killing my soul, I guess. <laughs> 
so I had that that really bad experience previously and then um and then I worked with like two product managers that were really awesome and stuff but there was still this like weird like who's who's doing what a little bit and I think the way that you just spoke about it makes a lot of sense to me right if the product manager was focusing a little bit more on the market research and understanding where it fits in the market and understanding you know the things that are going to make it successful in the market that to me seems like a better place for them to focus than and then having the ux designer focus on the users right so it's and i think another thing that i'll say too around this and this is i think what i'm trying to say about expanding the dialogue is and, and I'm starting to see this, by the way, in some progressive companies, and it actually makes me really happy, but um, maybe we should be hiring designers now to be the product managers and vice versa. You know, it's like, how, how different are they really? Is this really a two-role job anymore? And we've tried really hard to sort of say, no, we're in here, and business has sort of been trying to still shove us out. And maybe that's because we're not positioning ourselves well enough to say, you know what? Actually, what I do is actually product manager. You know, it's yeah. like... We, if you take my skills and what I'm doing, I can just visualize these stories better than most product managers. So I've got a little, uh, little more skill there. I need to kind of bone up a little bit on performance issues and, you know, go to market type skills. But it's like, I think that's one of the things I've been trying to tell designers lately is, you know, we've got to start expanding our business skills and, you know, because I'm not start, I'm starting to feel like those roles really aren't separate anymore. And you know, yeah. businesses don't see them separate. Businesses don't want to pay for two people to do the same job. Yeah. You know, they don't want to pay for two people to divide and conquer. That's just seen in business as inefficiency and expense. So, um, so anyways, that's been interesting. Is how are we sort of getting into that conversation? What does it mean? And then the only other one that really keeps me up, and it was alluded to in that article, is just how are we you know, sort of intersecting into the new transformations that are occurring with technology, you know, internet of things, artificial intelligence, you know, what is going to be the impact of that to the design industry and how are designers going to kind of influence and direct that? And to me, if we're went out into development, you know, which again, sort of seems to be where we are sometimes. Uh, yeah. We're going to end up becoming AI checkers. So the AI, which is already happening, by the way, companies like Netflix, I saw a really interesting article the other day, and, and I'm, I'm kind of slow on some of this, by the way, but I was blown away. Maybe that's my age again, but um, I was blown away. Like at Netflix, like they have an AI that kind of generates layouts for different countries, and they then have a role that says that's designed well, that one's designed well, this one, the kerning got thrown off, right, or whatever, and so then they fix it. And I can see where as this starts to happen more and more, like, you know, design could start to be kind of, again, if, if business is seeing us so much in the how, we're going to be then helping robots with the how. But where we need to be is really having deep conversations at the strategy, at the principle and the purpose level now. I really feel like design needs to start making a shift towards values and virtues uh, and really understanding what that means because, you know, technology is only as good as we want it to be and it's only as bad as we want it to be. People make technology good or bad. The mistakes we've seen with Facebook uh, was because that's how the technology was designed and there was oversight there. You know, people just didn't think, you know, that some of these things could happen the way they did and that's not trying to shame Facebook by any means. I mean, it's a, it's a tough thing to be and I know that this article that I wrote talked about it a little bit but it's like we're trying to get to market faster and faster technology is enabling us to get to market faster and faster but there's these deep discussions needed now around why we're doing it what are some of the things that could go wrong there's this great process I read many years ago uh, that was written called activity center design I don't think it really it never really took off but it was another kind of centered design instead of user centered it was activity centered but was really interesting about that methodology was they talked a lot about they thought they didn't frame things in terms of customer they framed technology in terms of the context the environment and the activity that was being supported and one of the things that they said was that when you release technology into the wild it changes the wild you know it's not like the world adapts, you know, the world doesn't, the technology just doesn't fit perfectly into the world. The technology actually 
adjusts the world. The world adapts to the technology and vice versa. And they were saying there's all kinds of uses behind cell phones and there are things that we just never would have guessed until it was released. And you know, they were making a case even way back then that we need to spend more time thinking about these scenarios. You know, what happens when this gets out there? Yeah. What would be the impact? What are some of the things that could go wrong? How would this affect a customer set with dramatically different beliefs? You know, and I don't think we're having those conversations enough, but I think that these design skills that we have, empathy, qualitative research, we really can get into that conversation. And I want to see us getting more into that conversation. You know, that's yeah. the other thing I guess I think about a lot, you know. So talking a little, I'm going to wrap this up in a sec because I, I know that you probably need to go, but I, I, I did want to kind of, because um, I agree with you, right? Like if, if you design something, then you should be able to think like, what is the impact of this? And what is the potentially negative impact of this? Obviously, I didn't design it to be negative, but let's just, you know, humans are humans and somebody's maybe going to use this in a way that they shouldn't be using it. So let's take a moment to think about what those issues could be. How do you um, get businesses on board with this type of design when it slows down the timeline a little bit? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, you know, I don't have the answer, I think, for that <laughs> one yet, you know, because, I yeah. mean, you're right, it is going to slow things down. But I think, I think where the conversation is going to have to be is that we can't afford to not be having those. And I yeah. think those conversations, and I almost, I think of them, one way we might be able to deal with that is to think of them as being parallel processes. You know, it's not, I'm doing this thinking and this visioning to then immediately release a product. It's more kind of we're releasing products, but this thinking is being invested in. You know, I think that companies are going to need to start spending the money to simply have teams that are exploring these things, thinking about them before we're putting them on the go-to-market path, you know, and um, it really truly investing more in innovation, I think you could say, but more of like a principle-centered yeah. innovation where we're really kind of exploring ethical issues and all kinds of stuff along with our normal process. But um, I think that's how we're going to have to do it is we're going to have to like parallel path them. And I think some companies are starting to do like Google's got principles around AI. So, which is awesome. Um, but you know, it's starting to kind of play out some of the scenarios that's going to be, I think really important. Yeah. You know, who would have, who would have thought that, an, you know, being anonymous could lead to so much cyber bullying and other stuff. So, yeah. Yes. And not even being anonymous. I mean, we have cyberbullying and spades with people who are even, you know who they are. And you're like, stop bullying me. <laughs> yeah, there's just something that changes the dynamic between like, I'm not face to face with you in person, so you can't punch me. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what, you know, what, I'm sure somebody probably way back said, you know, that maybe people are going to feel more emboldened to be rude to each other. But it's at an epic proportion that I don't think anybody thought was going to be so bad. So, you know, unfortunately we didn't get on top of that, but maybe yeah. we're going to have to start taking negative consequences more seriously than we have before. Yeah. So maybe in, in the end, like part of a theme that I'm hearing and I actually experienced early in my career, I worked at an agency where the, um, the sprint cycle didn't really include the designers. We would, we would be at the sprint meeting so that we could understand where development was and kind of just have a bigger view of things. But it was a little bit, I don't want to use the word waterfall, right? Because people get really upset when you start using that word. But it was the designers had the chance to really like explore things and think about these like big overarching designs and how they all interconnected with each other instead of being given, you know, a few little stories at a time, which I don't think works for design. Like, I think that that's a terrible no. way to design. Because you got to get the vision done first. You exactly. Got so yeah, I, on. I was uh, in early in my career at this wonderful agency that I think did it in this weirdly, like it feels innovative way when you look at what people are doing now. And that's where I started. So then when I went other places, I was very confused, right? Like, wait a <laughs> second, like, why, why are we doing it this other way? Why are you giving me a story? I don't understand. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. So maybe the thing that I would also hope is in the future that um, there, people could see the value of being able to give design a little bit more time and being able to see like the overarching um, connectivity of all of the different pieces of design and then sending it into the sprint cycle because I agree with you on that. 
Yeah, totally. You know, maybe it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, this market testing piece too, but it's like, let's get all, like you're saying, like, let's get all the components together and test them. You know, like when we were at McGraw, uh, we've been studying blended learning, you know, which is print face-to-face -face instruction and digital. And, you know, the best way to do that is try to get some prototypes of all those components together and just test them all together and really see the ramifications. Like what happens when I have this workbook and this digital thing in front of, you know, an eight year old in a classroom, what can, what's the damage that can be done or what's the positive things that can happen? And, you know, I think that kind of large scale testing, we need more of it and we need more support. You know, we're going to need business to just get on board with that and say, hey, let's just go do this. And there's some companies that are great models. McDonald's, believe it or not, does some amazing full scale testing. Uh, so there's definitely places out there that the rest of us could learn from, you know. It inspires me. It makes me want to create um, like a kind of a, a website where designers kind of nominate companies that are, you know, d doing design in a way that's going to effectively kind of help the future. Because then, then maybe that would get businesses a little bit more interested if there was like, oh, we want to be on this list. And so how do we get on the list? And like, what is it that we need to do that's going to change? Um, I, I don't know if that's maybe I'm like kind of trying to shame businesses in order to make change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's your there's your next business right there, Terry. You can do that next. <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah, just having like because I would love a list of of businesses like that, right? Like if you're saying McDonald's does, and then we've also talked about a, a few other businesses. Um, those are the businesses that I would have wanted to tell my UX students when I was teaching, like go after these, and I think. What I will say too, if while I'm just on the topic is, I think a lot of times when people are entering the design field, they're willing to sacrifice a little bit of their ethics um, in terms of what they know is actually right and what they are actually using their skills for. And I, I would just hope that we could make sure that all of our students are taught to not say yes to those jobs and turn down those companies because that's how we do create a lot of power and movement in terms of those companies having to change. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because they can't get the talent that they need. You know? Exactly. So yeah. I don't I don't know how you instill that kind of backbone in somebody, but I, I would hope that like people and I think most of them do, right? Most people do, but I just I worry about the people that that freak out and they get into the scarcity mindset of paying their bills. And and I I'd always just think like the right thing will come. You'll be fine. It'll be okay. Um, you'll get the job that you need to and along the way you can actually change the way that the design industry interacts with the business industry by saying yes or no to certain jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well thank you so much for this whole entire discussion. It's been amazing. Um, I, I appreciate you having me. It's been great being able to talk and to share some of these different thoughts about design and everything the industry and business and how things have changed. <laughs> so much. So I'll definitely link your article. And I think you also have a secondary one that you mentioned that I'll, I'll ask you for and link it when I, when I share this video as well. But it's been amazing. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.